perfect love. Your perfect love. Long-lasting, hallelujah, well, eternal, not just long-lasting, eternal, glory to God and perfect, glory to God. We'll turn around and tell somebody, I'm glad that Jesus is my Lord, hallelujah. Then you can be seated. All righty. So are we running slow this morning? Huh? Oh, fastest we've ever had. Oh, okay, I'll see the rest of it, okay. We had the highest uh, megabits per second we've ever had. Well, glory. That means y'all are not going to get uh, trampled on with a bunch of overlap. And ugh. Anyway, glory to God. Good to have everybody this morning. Good to have those joining us on Facebook. Hallelujah. And uh, soon to be more than Facebook. Um, about everything you can think out there. Uh, Mevo's now come up with some stuff. We can uh, pay a monthly fee and go out to about five different uh, venues live uh, at the same time. Uh, Mevo to our our own website. We can stream to our website live. Um, YouTube, uh, Facebook, obviously, Periscope, Twitter. We could just hit them all live. So um, catch the whole social media world. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Glory to God. And that's all going to go coincide with some good things happening. Glory to God. Some plans are coming down the pipe. Hallelujah. Don't you know what, want to know what they are? We're not going to tell you. Amen. Glory to God. We are going to tell you, just not today. It's going to make you anticipate. Hallelujah. But, you know, um, you know, even old, an old barn needs a fresh coat of paint every once in a while. Yeah, so we, we're going to put a fresh coat of paint on things, hallelujah, and um, we're going to revamp the image, glory to God. Uh, listen, not because we're not going to change who we are. I mean, you know, if you put paint on an old barn, it's still an old barn, all right? You didn't change the barn. You just put it, you just put new paint on it. Looks better, but it's the same barn, all right? Hallelujah. And uh, we, we want to we freshen up the image and uh, so we can take what we have in the in the not old barn, but in what we have, what God's given us, because, you know, the Word of God's always fresh, and um, be able to reach more people with it. Hallelujah. And, um, you know, get them to come on in. Amen. Now, we're not going to do something stupid, you know. Uh, I, I don't want to do something stupid like tear the barn down, you know, and try. Now, have you ever seen these restaurants with a little hole in the walls, you know, and they go out and they go build a fancy one, and as soon as they build a fancy one, they just go under, because they couldn't, they couldn't 
support the change that what, what made them them they changed you know because they, they changed everything and it just wasn't them anymore we're never going to change who we are all right we who we are is who we are uh, but we can we can make you know more appealing uh, we can make it and i don't mean by compromising i mean make it more appealing you know um, freshen up some things and um, we're looking at some various ways of doing that and um, you know um, we're going to let you know as soon as we kind of kind of get close to nailing it down. All righty? There's going to be some logo changes. How about that? <coughs> you know? You know, glory to God. <coughs> and um, something that, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're in the century that we're in. Amen. You know? And at the same time, uh, be eternal with what we are. So it can be done. I said, it can be done. We, we can revamp and stay who we are. Uh, okay? I mean, you know, Brother Bill's the same man even after he shaved the beard. <laughs> Amen? I mean, it, it kind of got down here. One, how far down did it get, Belinda? Yeah, it got, it got camp, but, but bushy out there, you know? <laughs> cut, it up, cut it back and everything. It's, it's, it's the same Bill. Just, you know? It doesn't look like a dead animal crawling up under there. <laughs> Every time Van Crouch comes, he uses that same thing on him. <laughs> hey, brother, it's like a dead animal died up there in your chin there. Glory to God. So anyway, uh, there, we're working on some stuff this summer and um, working with our, our marketing team. I, I hate using that word, but, that's, you know, what else do you call them? I mean, your image team, your the image team. Okay, we'll call them the image team instead of marketing. Cause, but you are you are you are in in the world vernacular marketing we don't we don't i'm not marketing for the sense of getting people to come in and get something they didn't they didn't buy into all right now you've been to a restaurant seen a little placard on the table that had a piece of cheesecake on it that was seven inches tall about you know yay wide and and a whole can of you know cherries and syrup on top of it right and then when it comes out to your table it looks like you know it's been on a crash diet it's two inches tall about a sliver wide and a cherry with a little bit of syrup on it, you know. Uh, you know when you're looking at the picture and you're looking at this, and you you were you know, willing to go seven dollars. That's okay. Seven dollars for that ain't okay. Okay, we've all been there, haven't we? I'll face that. All right. Well, uh, in in the church, we don't want to present something and then not deliver what we're presenting. Amen. We, we want to deliver what we are, amen, and uh, to people because people need the truth and need the light, glory to God. And uh, we want to be able to do that. And, but I believe there's a way that you can, you can get people to notice you and not change your message, not change who you are, and, and, and introduce them to the things of God that we've walked in and know about for some time. Amen. Glory to God. I don't believe Paul ever changed his message. And I don't necessarily believe he changed his method. He may have changed uh, maybe an approach. He may have depending on who he's ministering to. You know, um, remember when they went to the, uh, the village or the city and they had all the statues to the different gods and they had one to the unknown God? Well, he didn't come in and go, you know, uh, your, your gods are, are, are going to take you to hell. He just came and said, I noticed that you're all together superstitious and you have a, you have a, 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 a statue to an unknown God. That's who we've come to declare unto you. He was able to, to market at that moment to them the truth. Amen? So what we want to do is we, wanna, we want to come to the world who is looking for answers and, and, you know, and, and give them the answer. So here's what you look at. Here's, we believe this is what you can look for, and you'll get blessed by it. Hallelujah. So anyway, that's where we are, and it's, it's, it's good. We're believing God for a, a really good thing. Amen? Amen. And you believe you're going to be blessed by it. Hallelujah. And you're going to be able to jump on board with us. And what we will do is we kind of get this thing nailed down. We're going to come into the church and we'll say, here's, what, here's our idea. And we want you to get on board with us and let's run together. Amen. I'm still going to be Pastor Ed. I'm not coming in skinny jeans. <laughs> I was trying that kind of bedhead thing for a while. Just, I just, I just, I'm still not rocking, working that. I'm just trying. I've been trying it. Kids bought me some stuff, said, try this, Daddy. I tried it, and 
And I'm, I'm kind of like, I may do it again, but I'm like, it's, it's, it's uh, and I can, I don't do it right. Nathan, Nathan came to the school one day to see me, and I had done it, and he said, he, said, he thought I put my fingers in an electric socket because it was just too, well, which, what, what is it? Which, what do you want? You tell me I'm to, you know, I need to do something, get it all, whatever, and then when I do it, you tell me I did too much. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, what is it? <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, it's time to give this morning. Also, real quick reminder, important reminder, no Wednesday night service. Community center is closed, um, and so we're not be having church on this Wednesday. Um, we can't. They're closed. And um, it, would, it would cost us extra money if they would even open it up for us. We don't even know that they would. Um, we didn't check because, you know, it was going to cost us the extra stipend to have them come out uh, to open it up if they would. And um, we just said, 4th of July, might not even have anybody show up hardly anyway. You know, uh, everybody's going to be doing 4th of July stuff. So we decided we're just not going to even fight it. We're not having it. Okay? On a Sunday would be a different, but on a Wednesday night, that's that's when everybody wants to do the fireworks. That's when they all want to do their what their cookouts, whatever they're doing, uh, blow up stuff. Yeah, make sure you blow it up in a, in a proper location. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But that's what else Wednesday night. Let's go. If you need an offering envelope, raise your hand, Brother Joe's in the aisle ready to assist you. If you're uh, writing your check, make it pay with the Faith and Victory Church. If you're giving with square cash, you can go ahead and send that. Um, if you're giving with dope, glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. You love Jesus? Hallelujah. All righty. We sure love you. Thank God for you. We do. I know we got people traveling. This is uh, Friday began the 4th of July uh, vacation week for a lot of people. Some companies completely shut down that week. Uh, a lot of people take their vacation that week. I, I try not to go anywhere where people are going to be that week for obvious reasons. I went, we went to the beach one time. went to Myrtle Beach one time. Read my lips. Never. I mean, you go, you go down to the beach, and it's, you know, um, can you squeeze in this spot without touching them? I mean, you're just, just this wall-to-wall -wall bodies, you know, all over the place. When you get in your car and drive down the road, it's, well, it's not driving. It's, you know, you can have a Flintstone mobile and get around fine. Foot power, all right? So praise the Lord. Anyway, um, it, we just don't do that. So, but there are a lot of our people out this week, and you know, doing different things. There's, um, um, I know Gwen's sister's funeral was this weekend. Um, her sister passed away a couple of weeks ago. And we're going to do the, the, the service this weekend. And, um, but all, all together, uh, there's people traveling. They're not here with us. So just be praying that they'll continue to have a, a good time, with safe travels, um, be kept safe in Jesus' name. Can you say Amen? amen. Glory to God. Amen. And. Uh, and, and just keep on loving Jesus, while, even where they are. Amen. You ready, you ready to give? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that people are blessed, covered by your blood, and walk in the fullness of the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you they, they walk in the full supply of all that you have for them because they sow into the kingdom. Heaven's windows are open unto them, and you pour out or empty out blessings they don't have room enough to receive. And because of that, there are delights in land that lend to many and don't borrow. And, Father, I decree I decree that they walk in the land of the living in full supply. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Go ahead and receive that, Brother Joe. Hallelujah. And thank you all for giving. Thank you for giving through uh, electronic means or through your uh, regular method. Glory to God. We like, you know, we still take the old-fashioned cash. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, that still spins, by the way. Amen. All right. Children's Church, you're dismissed at this time. Go ahead. Glory to God. Miss Janie's awaiting. Hallelujah. Along with Shanny Wanny. All right. We've been, we're going to, we are going to conclude today. I promise you. But I'm going to try. <laughs> Hallelujah. What to do when faith seems weak and victory lost. And again, 
we'll just recap the points real quick. I'm not. I'm going to endeavor not to get hung up on any of them and, and start preaching on them again as I go through them. All right. So points one through nine. Number one is a two-parter. It's recognize the source, and we said we need to recognize the source of the problem, and then secondly, recognize the source of the answer. Number two was be sure that the promises of God cover the things you ask for. You know, you, Jaron, get ready to go expound. You know, uh, get scripture for what you believe in God for. Uh, number three was be sure you're not living in sin. Why? Because if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And we know that whatever we ask of him, we shall receive. Amen? But only if our heart condemn us not. If you're in sin, your heart will condemn you. God doesn't have to. Your own heart will. Amen. Um, so hard not to expound. Number three, number four, be sure no doubt or unbelief is permitted in your life. Uh, number five was sincerely desire the benefit. Number six is ask in God nothing wavering. Double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. Number seven, that was number six. Number seven is do not tolerate a thought to the contrary. You got to cast down the imaginations and thoughts and bring them into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Glory to God. Number eight is count the thing done. <clears throat> Last week we were covering number 10 or 9 was give glory to God. Remember by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now this morning is not very long. But, you know, I couldn't finish up last week, so we're going to finish up this morning. But we do have communion. Praise the Lord. Uh, number, act, uh, number 10. Brrr, can I get a drum roll? You know, Dick, can you, you know, I need a drum. I mean, somebody with some, with some bongos or something or, uh, you know, whatever. Drum roll. Number 10. All right. Act as though you have received. Um, faith has an action. Wigglesworth, Brother, Brother Wigglesworth, you know, the great um, uh, English preacher, um, called many by the, the apostle of faith, uh, preached in the mid-1900s, um, would get, get on the platform and say, and, and just holler to the top of his lungs to the crowd, faith is an act. Faith is an act. Faith is an act. Now, we've talked about numerous times in our teaching on the subject of faith that we, um, the number one way to release our faith is to speak it. But once you've released it, it becomes the governing factor of how you conduct yourself. In other words, you act like you said what you said, you believe it. Now, you act like you believe it, you're acting, you're acting like you believed it because you believed it. In other words, if you believe something, you will act like it. Now, I believe that if I drive over here a couple, uh, about, about a mile and a half and get on Interstate 40 and head west until I get into Oklahoma and then pick up the um, Muskogee Turnpike, okay, I believe that I will get to Tulsa. Now, the first time I did it, I believed it. Now, of course, I've done it so many times now, I can almost do it blindfolded. All right, I can tell you where, where the eating spots are. And the what? And the rest stops. That's right. They, they get amazed. I can tell them what, what mile marker rest stops are on roads that I travel. There's a reason for that. You learn those things when you got kids in the car going, And you're going, it's 32.3 miles from where we are right now. Can you hold it? No! Okay? But I, I know from here to the border, I can tell you where they are. You know, I know exactly where they are because I do them so many times. Oh, boy. Anyway, border in Tennessee. <clears throat> but I believe, now, I can believe that all day long. I can say, I, I'll tell you. If you'll go over here and get on Interstate 40 and go west, and you stay on the Interstate 40 all the, way, all the way to the North Carolina border, go into Tennessee, stay on the Interstate 40, uh, Tennessee. Now, when you get to Nashville, you got to take I-240 around to pick 40 back up 
okay, because it used to cut through the city. It doesn't cut through anymore. They, they, they cut that off. The bridges, I don't know why they did that. The first time I went to Tulsa, I went right through Nashville. But the old 40s, been, I mean, I mean, they cut the road up. They torn the road up. The bridges are sitting there falling apart where they just left them, some of the bridges. You know, used to go straight through, but they, they sent everything around now. But, you know, pick up the I-240. Uh, it's shorter to go, no on, go north, you know, to the right when you get there. You go around the north side of, of Nashville, not Nashville, Memphis. Memphis, it's shorter to go around the north side of Memphis and come back around and pick it back up uh, to go across the Mississippi, okay? Then when you do that, you go across the Mississippi and the west Memphis, Arkansas, stay on Interstate 40 all the way to Oklahoma. When you get to Oklahoma, you go down uh, to about um, uh, 3, 360, 370 um, and pick up the Muskogee Turnpike north. And from there, it's about uh, 72 miles to Tulsa. At 80 miles an hour. I gotta love a turnpike. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you get there in less than an hour. Okay. Now, I can tell you that if you believe that, you say, well, I believe I can get to Tulsa by taking 40 to the Muskogee Turnpike and going north. Yeah. But if you don't act on it, it won't do you anything. You won't get there. You can actually get on 40 and just go, you know what? I got, I got the little rock. I, thought, I don't think Pastor Ed told the truth. I'm going to waver. I'm going to pick up I-30 here in Little Rock. Hello, Dallas. Because <laughs> that's where you're heading, okay? You're, you're heading to Dallas. You're, not gonna get, you're, good. you're going to Dallas. Um, if, you, if you get there and waver and go to I-30, you ain't going to get Tulsa. You can't. You hear me say it, and you go, I believe what Pastor Ed said. And don't act on it, you'll never get to Tulsa. Okay? We can believe something, and we can say it. You can be going to tell people, hey, I'll tell you what. You want, someone says, I need to get to Tulsa. You know what? I can tell you how to get to Tulsa. Go get on 40 West, take 40 all the way to Oklahoma. And when you get to Oklahoma, look for Mus Muskogee Turnpike, go north on Muskogee Turnpike, take you right into Tulsa. And never do it yourself. And it won't do you any good. Because there's no actions corresponding with what you're saying. Okay? We have to have actions that line up with our words. Not in order to make our words come to pass, but because we believe the words we speak are true. And we speak what we've already known from the Word of God. Make sure the promises of God cover it. Amen? Don't let doubt and unbelief in. Don't waver. And so we already have the foundation for that. Now we have to put action to what we're saying. Do you really believe it or not? Amen. If you're saying it, there's going to have to be some action with it. Now, um, you know, I remember um, a number of years ago, Brother Hagan told the story about the woman that, you know, he went to pray for her, you know, and, and um, took some people from the church with him because, you know, uh, he had uh, kind of seen some things happen in the spirit. And he got there, and this woman was... Um, had, had gotten so, the arthritis so bad, her body joints would actually freeze up. You know, they told him, you know, what are you going to be laying down or sitting in a chair? And she chose sitting in a chair. That she had to stay in the chair. They took her out of the chair. She was shaped to the chair. The joints, had, the arthritis had just frozen the joints in those positions. And so she's she's in the chair. And um, he came in there and and they said, Sister Lord Jesus Christ sent me. And he said, um, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. He said, God's my witness, my wife's my witness, the people from the church I took with me are my witness. She floated right up out of that chair and then floated out in front of the chair in the air. I don't believe that. Oh, just, just turn it off and go away. That's one reason the church can't get anything done because the church don't believe nothing. They don't believe in miracles. Well, I, I can't believe that happened. People, people walked on water. Jesus walked on water. Peter walked on water. The Red Sea was split. The Jordan River got split so many times, they didn't know which way, whether it was coming or going. Every time some prophet showed up, it got hither and thithered. Are you here? I mean, you know, I mean, you know, the Jordan River probably had a name for the prophets. You know what it was? Here comes hither and thither. Because that's what I'm getting ready to have to do. Go hither and thither. Got to divide. You know, you know, they come up to the water, go whack, boom. Everybody walk over on dry ground. Prophets, apparently, prophets didn't like water, unless they were baptized, the folks. 
But for just you know, swimming and stuff, they didn't like the recreational swimming. They wanted to go over on dry ground. All right? See, we don't believe in, the church doesn't believe in miracles as a whole anymore. They really don't. We think a miracle is, you know, a, a beautiful sunset. It's not a miracle. That's not a, that's not a divine intervention into the ordinary course of affairs of man. It may be beautiful. It may be gorgeous. But it's not a miracle. It's not a miracle sunset. It was a beautiful sunset. Miracle sunset would be it got to a certain spot and stayed there for six hours. Now, that would be a miracle, okay? Yeah. I think the, moon, the sun and the moon said we don't need more Joshua's running around. Okay? So, but she floated out there in front of that chair, and, and she's sitting there, and he says, now rise and says, now walk. All she had to do was act on what was taking place. And she went, he said, she went, oh, oh, and reached back with her hands and got a hold of that chair and pulled it up under her. And when she did, she went, kerplunk. He said, sister, you don't have a bit of faith, do you? She said, no, I don't. As a matter of fact, I'll go to my grave with this chair. He said, she knew she did. See, we got to add action to our faith. There's got to be action that corresponds with the faith that's in action. Amen? Um, Mark eleven twenty four 24 said, Jesus said, everybody say Jesus said. Kenneth Hagin didn't say it. Faith preachers, you know, we repeated and we, caught, and we shared what Jesus said, but we didn't make it up. Amen? There, Jesus said this. Everybody say, Jesus is the head of the church. He speaks with divine authority. And when I quote him, I speak with divine authority. All right? Mark eleven twenty four says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire. When ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. So Jesus said that we have to believe before it ever shows up. And then when we believe, we start acting like it. And we get the example. We, we've talked about this already. But Genesis 17, 5, Neither shall thou be called Abram anymore, but thy name should be called Abraham, for the father of many nations have I made thee. So Abraham was to change his name in order to declare and continue to act on in, in a verbal way what he believed God had done made him the father of a many nations. God which calleth those things which be not as though they were, who makes reference to things that do not exist as though they did. God wants us as believers to be acting on the faith that we have. Now, that does not mean you go down to the car dealership and write a $30,000 check for the car that you, you believe that you received. Now, a check, there's no such thing as a faith check. A check is a, a, a legal binding document that says, I have this much money in the bank and I am transferring it to you. There's, nothing, there's no faith involved in that. That's different than saying, I'm coming Friday and I'll have the money because you, Lord, you know, you've got it in your heart. Brother Hagin did that. He told, told the guy, you know, a guy said, I gotta have I gotta have money for this house in 10 days or whatever. And he said, he said, I'll have it. He didn't have it. He told the guy, I'll have it to you in 10 days. Are you here? That's not writing a faith check. See now, he's, he's, he thanked the Lord that he had the answer. And some woman shows up and told him, The Lord told me, no, the Lord told me a few days to get this to you, but I just I'm, I'm you know, she finally got it, it was last day. And comes and gives him $1,000. Ten $100 bills. Goes, go, thank, thank you. He, he already had it. But he was confessing it and acting on it. And he was acting like it was so. He was planning on going to see the guy with the money. But he didn't write him a faith promise check. Are you here? See, that's, 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 we, we get mixed up sometimes. You can't go to the dealership and write a $30,000 check and say, you know, praise the Lord. There it is. Let me have the car. They ain't, let me tell you the first thing. They ain't going to give you the car on the check. They ain't going to wait till it clears. Hello. Most of them don't even take checks anymore, you know, unless you've got a cashier's check or a certified check from a bank or whatever. They won't even take your credit card to buy it with. 
You could have a $100,000 credit line on credit limit on your car. They won't take it. Nope. They won't take a credit card for, for, for that. I don't know why. Maybe they had laws concerning credit cards that you can, you know, you can return the car within a certain amount of time because, you know, whatever, or because it was a credit card or whatever. I don't know all the reasons for it, but they won't do it. Yeah, and your interest rate is not good unless you've got a really good interest. If you've got a $100,000 credit line, you probably have the lowest interest rate there is. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, but anyway, so when you begin to act on it, you begin to act like it's so. But you're not acting out. See, here's where we, get, here's where we got confused in the church. We began to do things to try to convince us that we really believed what we said. Hello. You see, we weren't doing things because we believed what we said. We're trying to convince ourselves by actions that we believed what we said. Well, if you're trying to convince yourself, you didn't believe what you said. Amen? But when you do believe what you said, when I say, now listen, understand we're, we're not recovering all the ground again <clears throat> of all of our teaching on faith from the past and right in, in, in this series. <clears throat> but our, what, our confession has to be based on, remember what Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three, 23? Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. Verse 24, Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Amen? Notice that you have to believe it in your heart and say it with your mouth. Saying it with your mouth and then going out and doing stuff to try to prove that you believe it is not what we're talking about. The actions are a result of what you believe when you spoke, not the believing a result of actions on based on what you said. Can't get them mixed up. Can't be going around, you know, like you've heard people taking their glasses off. Somebody comes up in a prayer line, get instant, gets instantly healed. Can't, and eyes instantly healed, don't need glasses. Then you got somebody running around, we used to call them Coke bottle glasses. Remember those? They're so thick. I mean, they're, they're so thick and so big that the person wearing them, their eyeballs look like, you know, they're this big themselves. And it's just because they're magnified on the other side, they're so big. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You can start a forest fire with, it, with your glasses. Okay? And uh, they hear that, take the glasses off, and then go out and start driving. Run all up on the curb, all over the line, and, and then they're out in the ditch and all this kind of stuff, and come back going, you know, I don't understand. Well, I'll tell you what, what you don't understand is you're trying to prove that you believe something, not because you believed it, but because you saw somebody else happen there and you won't copy it. You've had to, um, the, 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 the story of the, um, the, the oil wells. Dad used to tell a story about, you know, about the guy who came into his church. Oh, it, was old, it was an old man. And, um, you know, uh, he got a hold of faith, got a hold of the Word of God. The Spirit of God spoke to him one day and said, I want, and, and, and see, when you get into faith, God will start talking to you. And see, let me say this. When God speaks to you, it's just as much the Word of God as the written Word. But it will always line up with the written Word. You're not going to get an audible voice or God speaking to your spirit in the still small voice or the leading of the Holy Ghost that's contradictory to the Word of God, the written Word. But when it's in line with it and it's the Spirit of God in manifestation to your heart, um, <clears throat> then it's just as much the Word of God as the written Word. But I always predicate that you can't, you can't get a verbal word or a word from the Holy Spirit in your spirit that's contrary to the written Word. All right. In other words, you can't get a word to go believe for somebody else's wife. Why? Because God said, Jesus said, to do that is to lust after in your heart, and you've committed adultery already. And God's word forbids adultery. So God's not going to give you a word to go commit adultery. Because that would make him a party to sin. No. Okay. But God can tell you, you know, I, I, I've given you a wife, and you can't use your faith to get a certain woman if God didn't 
reveal to you that's the right person. You can't look at somebody and go, oh, I like the way they look. I believe I receive them in Jesus' name. You might not want them when you get them. Huh? There's a lot of people who've gotten eye candy, and when they got home, found out it was, it was sweet and sour. It was sweet on the outside and sour on the inside. Hello? And they wish they hadn't ever got a hold of that thing. Huh? Sang, woman sing. Yeah. <laughs> Pastor Hagen, he tells you, tell a story about the man who married a woman because she could, he, she would play the piano and sing, and, uh, you know, she could enhance his ministry. He married him about two weeks after they got married. He's at the breakfast table. And he's got the newspaper. He lowers the paper and looks across the table. And when sang, woman sang, <laughs> he realized, you know, the only, the only redeeming quality was she could sing. Wasn't, wasn't the looks. All right. Anyway, where was I? I want to know if y'all know. Because I don't. I done forgot. So the, the actions that we take. You know, oh, the old guy. So the, the, this, this guy, you know, he, he'd been getting a hold of faith. The Lord spoke to him and said, I want you to uh, go drill here and uh, then drill at a 45-degree angle. So he goes out to his foreman. He says, we, we need to drill over here. We need to drill at a 45-degree angle. And the, and the foreman says, goes and pulls out the geological and says, we can't drill there. There's no oil there. He said, I said, I want you to drill here and drill at a 45-degree angle. The guy said, we can't. And he finally says, I'm the boss. I'm paying your salary. Drill here. He did. Did it at a 45-degree angle. They struck oil. Well, we come back out. Again, the Spirit of God tells him where to go drill next. He does it, tells the guy. The guy thinks he, had a, he, was just, he was just lucky, whatever, for the first time, and they had to go through the same argument, whatever. They do that two or three times, and about after, the, after that third, third or, or maybe three or four times, after the third or fourth time, finally the guy comes in and puts the geologicals away and says, where do you want to drill next? Because they keep striking oil. Well, he gives his testimony in church. And another oil guy's in there and hears that, and he goes out and starts trying that and went bankrupt. Why? The story was not about you drill oil wells at a 45-degree angle by some whim. The lesson to be learned was to follow the leading of the Holy Ghost. Okay? In that particular case, it just happened to be oil wells, but you can't go drill your oil wells where the Holy Ghost didn't lead you just because it worked for somebody else. And the guy's trying to stand on the Scriptures. God's not a respecter of persons. No, he's not. He'll lead you just like he led the other guy. Not maybe the same manner or the exact same method, but he will lead you. In other words, he will lead you, and just like he led the other guy, he will lead you also. But it could be a completely different method. Amen? He could speak to you and say, buy this track of land. And you go buy it, and then there's oil on this land. And, you, and nobody knew it. It could be a completely different way. All right? So, you can't mimic somebody else and call that faith. Faith is because you've heard the word, you've received that word, you believe it in your heart, and now you say it with your mouth and you act upon it. Amen. Your actions are in line with what you believe. And you're believing, you're, you're believing what you're saying, you're saying what you're believing. And it's, it almost can sound um, whatever, I'm not really sure what, you know, um, like you're trying to, you know, the power of positive thinking. We're not, we're not talking about the power of positive thinking. We're talking about the power of believing. But our belief is based on something eternal and steadfast and sure. God's Word. God is not a man that he should lie. Not a son of man that he should repent. He doesn't change his mind. He's not going to promise you one thing, and then, then when it comes to actually doing it, him turn, turn around and go, well, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. And why not? I'm God. I can do whatever I want to do. He can't lie. I said he can't lie. And if he promised you that if you did this, he would do this, and if you do this and he doesn't do that, then he lied. And God can't lie. So we have, to be, we have to be accurate with our absolutes. 
God can do anything he wants to do, and what he wants to do is what he said in his word he would do. He has, he, by his own free will and choice, bound himself to his own word. Thus, he can't break it. Hello? God cannot break it. So when we believe what he said, and we say what he, we believe that he said, in other words, we speak out of faith what we believe, then that begins to govern our actions. We begin to live our life in, you know, I live my life in the belief that Jesus is coming again. Dad Hagen used to have a statement he would make, you know, and it was, it was a great one. <clears throat> He'd always say this around the time that some bozo got a revelation, Jesus is coming back on such and such date. And everybody would start selling their homes and selling their cars and quitting their jobs and go get up on some mountain somewhere and hang out waiting for the rapture to take place. Now, number one, you don't need to be on a mountain because remember Jesus said there'll be one in the field and one here and they'll be taken. You, you don't have to be on a mountain to, get go, to go up. Aren't you glad we don't have, all have to ride at the Mount Mitchell if we, when the, the rapture is going to take place because it's the highest point on the eastern uh, east coast or east of the Mississippi and south of the Canada. And uh, get up on Mount Mitchell and be up there so Jesus can get us on the way by. Amen? I mean, if that were the case, the only people who are going to get raptured are the ones who can, make, who can climb Mount Everest. You know, that's not how it works. Amen? But you know, everybody's they kept coming, Jesus is coming back on, you know, September 7th, 8th, and 9th, you know, 1988, uh, Rosh Hashanah, you know, and uh, it give you the 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back. Book sequel was 89 reasons, and the 89th was he didn't come in 88. He could have had 32 sequels to that, that, that message in that book. Why, 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 what's, what's the, uh, you know, the 2018 reason? He didn't come in 2017. You remember the guy last year, a year ago, Jesus was coming back in March. And then it didn't happen, and he was going to come back in November. Or was that two years ago? I forget which it was. But, you know, billboard, Jesus. There was a thing out last year. People were preaching it all over the place. You know, the, the constellation, the, the, the Virgo and the Jupiter, it entered into the womb of Virgo, and when it exited, the rapture was going to take place. And people were going around preaching that Jesus was coming back, and it was, sept it was September the 23rd or 22nd that, 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 the, that Jupiter in the alignment of the stars would exit the womb of Virgo, the constellation. And that's when the rapture was going to take place. Yeah. When the moon <laughs> is in the seventh hour and Jupiter aligned with Mars. All right. This is the dawning of the... Okay. Thank you, Cap, for putting that in my head. Well, that's about how squirrely it is. We're still here. We didn't miss the boat. Jesus didn't come and leave us behind. Okay? So anyway... But Brother Hagin would say this. He would say, make this statement. He would say, live like Jesus is coming back any second. What do you mean? I believe he's coming back. And if I live like he's coming back any second, that controls and governs activities I conduct. Because, you know, if you think he's coming back 30 days from now, you might do some stuff for 29 days and then straighten up on day 30. But plan like he's not coming back for 50 years. In other words, make plans for your life, for ministry, for whatever it is you're doing. You know, don't not buy a house because Jesus is coming back any second. Don't not buy a car, you know, because Jesus is coming back any second. Are you here? If y'all here, you've gone home. We don't. You say, if we, you really believe he's coming back, if you really believe he's coming back, that's going to govern how you live. Amen. We don't preach enough about the return of the Lord. He'll come as a thief in the night, remember? Hallelujah. We, maybe we need to do a teaching on that, on that that we haven't done in a long time. Glory to God. Just to remind people, heaven's real. Jesus is coming back. It is getting closer. Hallelujah. I'm not going to give you a date or a time frame or a year or a couple within a five-year span. I know people do. 
just live like he's coming back any second and playing like he's not coming back for 50 years. But if I really believe that, if I'm telling Jesus is coming back, when you go out and tell people, like, the Lord's coming back. If you really believe that, you're going to put down your alcohol and your cigarettes and your dope. You're going to stop ripping people off. Hello? You're going to live, you're going to live your life in a way that honors him if you really believe it. Okay? Because your faith will be in action of the, uh, and represent that you really believe the Lord's returning for his church. Amen? Glory to God. And so we, we need to do this. Just like Abraham began to call himself Abraham, can call himself the father of many nations and tell everybody else, you got to call me Abraham. You know the guys had to look at him like, you crazy? I thought he went senile. Oh, they wouldn't say that. Listen, one person one time came out of the, um, they supposedly said they'd say it as a joke. I don't believe it. He, he messed with their prosperity message. When Brother Hagin came out and corrected prosperity. Well, he's the father of prosperity message, not the out-of-balance one. He didn't, he didn't preach the out-of-balance one. As a matter of fact, he called them all in to straighten them out about getting out of balance with it. Are y'all here? You're going home. And one of the preachers that were in the meeting where he tried to straighten them out, and, and, and it was so bad they had to hold the book, the Midas Touch, and hold it off a whole year before they could release it. They had it printed and ready to release at camp meeting and held it back for another year because of the, the way the meeting went. One said, well, I just believe he went senile. Now, they say he, was, he, he tried to cover that by saying he thought he was just trying to be funny. You don't, you know, it's not funny. That, was, that, wasn't a, that wasn't a funny meeting. It was a correction meeting. One preacher who went around and used Brother Hagin's name all over the planet and mimicked him, stood up on the platform and going, y'all knew who my spiritual father is. Said the Lord told him not to go and hurt his faith. You have many teachers, but not many fathers. When dad calls a family meeting, you show up. Especially when it's in a corrective nature to stop things from happening. It's going to hurt the church and, and the body of Christ. Now, that meeting wasn't going to hurt his faith. Maybe, maybe he had making some changes to how he was ministering. Maybe wasn't going to get as much money milked out of people. Hello? That went over big. We all run around and talk about it. it's so great that a preacher can have a million and a half dollar, two million dollar house, three million dollar house. Okay. Now, I honestly don't care if somebody has something for the ministry. If you get a $54 million jet and the Lord, for, for what God has for you to do for your ministry, then praise God you get whatever tool you need to go do, go do the work of God. I ain't got a problem with that. But you're going to get up and brag about how, how much money, you, how, how, how much your house costs, and how big, you, how many, you know, uh, extravagant cars you got, and all this kind of stuff. And you don't need all that for the ministry. You're just doing it a little lasciviously. I got a problem with that. I don't have a problem with having a nice house. There's nothing wrong with having a nice house. Hello? There's nothing wrong with having a nice car. Hello? But don't tell me. That the person who's, you know, that you're, you know, you're, 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 somebody comes in and says, now we're getting out of hand with the, with the, with the prosperity message. And you're, you're riding around and, you know, you got four car garage or five car garage and, you know, you got all these expensive cars in there and you're upset because somebody's messing with your, your revenue stream. Hello? Y'all hear you go home? No, no, dad, dad didn't preach excess. It's for the gospel. I've heard preachers, you know, he used to say, I'm believing God for a one-time gift of, you know, and when he got he got up to a million dollars, I think he you maybe got to two million. And for a one-time gift of, of one million dollars, one-time gift to the ministry. You know, to, to believe God for one. He said, what are you going to do with it? I'm going to tell you what we're going to do with it. We're going to pre print more books. We're going to go more places. We're going to go on more radio stations. We're going to reach more people with the gospel. He wouldn't believe God for a million dollars for him personally. He was believing God for a million dollars for the ministry, for the work of God to be done. Hello? I said, hello? 
God will take care of you. Amen? Glory to God. I kind of got off there a little bit. You know, you know we, we've got to get back to where we understand. Even in prosperity, you know, we're, our actions, we tithe because we believe. Amen? I believe if I tithe, God's going to honor. I believe if I give, God's going to honor. We're going to get the work of God done. It takes the money to get the work of God done. Amen. I said amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I didn't go to work last year because I, I thought it would be a, a, a joyous thing to go do. You know, I'm working another job because the, the finance in the church had, had, con, had contracted, and we have a job to do. And I need, we needed to be able to, I just went and made tents. I'm making tents. Making a difference where I'm making the tents, but I'm making the tents. Making the best tents there are. Hello? My, uh, my principal told me I was the best hire he's ever done. He's been doing it for 11 years. That was a pretty big compliment. So whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. Do it right, you know. Well, sure, I would, I'd like, you know, I'd like to be home not, you know, having to work during the, you know, during the school year and that kind of stuff and uh, just taking care of the ministry like we used to. And, and do it. But you know what? The ministry has to go forward. Amen. And that's not a lack of act of faith. My faith is we're going to finish our course. Amen. And if that means I go to work to keep things in a position so we can, we can finish our course at, the, at that moment, then we do that. And that's what we're doing. We're finishing our course. We're going to finish it strong. Paul did not make tents because he was in unbelief. He had a call. He had to fulfill his ministry. I had to fulfill my ministry. And, I, and we're doing what we need to do so to be in position to fulfill our ministry. Well, if the Lord calls you, he'll make a provision for you. I believe that too. Amen. We, our doors are still open. Believe that I'm going to finish my course. So I'm not going to fold in the tent and pack it up and quit just because money got tight. I believe we're called. So I'm going to do whatever I can. Whatever, if I need to do this because we're called... For a season, then I'll do what i got to do for a season so we can keep going. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Love Jesus? All right. Let's go see. The, we're going to see the Lord's table. Uh, please uh, get the ushers ready. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Uh, for those of you with us today, we love you. God bless you. Uh, you've seen some information on there about giving. If you want to give, you can go ahead and do that uh, today. Just remember this. We love you. Don't, don't, and don't forget, there won't be a Wednesday night service. Don't go looking for us on Wednesday night. You can go back and look at some of the old services. You'll, they're out there on our website, fbc.org, and uh, check that out. And until we meet again, we love you. God bless you. Remember this, that this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Praise the Lord. Yeah.